Yeah. Before jumping in exactly the title of my talk, which basically is Emerging Signaling Pathways in Cancer Therapy, this emerging comes from me, obviously, because the pathways that I've been studying in the last four years. Uh, just to show you the importance of genomics nowadays, I know that everybody knows that, but basically that's just uh, uh, how we see prostate cancer. It's a small gland uh, uh, that in, in men, don't forget about this, just joking. And usually in the past, they used to define the, the, the cancer as a gleason score. But nowadays, what is going on is, is moving to this type of uh, uh, analysis in which folks now are analyzing the whole genome and trying to see if one particular case is going to be indolent, it means the cancer is going to stay there and not going to progress, versus aggressive, which the cancer is going to spread uh, around the, uh, the body. <clears throat> Also, genomics nowadays are changing how we used to analyze the data. In the past, we used to analyze what we call com uh, common aspect of the disease. You, you get the tumor versus normal. We used to analyze as a pack. And now you're using uh, as a diversity of each particular disease. It means you get your normal uh, individual. You analyze towards uh, against different patients and try to find different therapies for the same disease. And uh, this is highlight for ex as an example, like uh, in lung cancer, uh, uh, you have EGF receptor mutations, and depending on the status of these mutations in a particular patient, you can use uh, a different drug. You know, Cal Arisa, you can use for when you have mutant EGF, uh, you have a response, but when you, uh, you have two mutations in EGFR and KRAS, you have a short survival, and the drug does not act correctly. Basically, what happens in genomics nowadays, they have, uh, 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 helps you in the diagnosis or a classification, prognosis, or a therapeutic choice with the end the end point is this, as I mentioned before, is an individualized medicine. Nowadays, the, uh, the concept of having patients with the same disease treated by different ways, it's much more in force in the clinic, anyway. That basically leads me what we do in the lab. We use basically all the uh, genomics and proteomics uh, aspects of the disease and try to do this in uh, conjunction with signaling transduction analysis in order to find targets in particular for cancer, which you're going to help us with diagnosis, classification, et cetera. And maybe what I'm going to show you today is after finding our target, we may end up in drug development in the future. Basically, that's the nice words that you find in my website. <laughs> That was our group, they, they, they study in Cape Town. And what I'm going to talk about today, oh, sorry, uh, we have four lines of research, basically uh, transcription factors, in particular the GET45 family, uh, translocations, uh, some uh, non steroid inflammatory drugs, and tyrosine kinase receptors. What I'm going to show you today is, in particular, the first part of the talk is about tyrosine kinase receptors in cancer. Basically, that's a slide that shows you what is a tyrosine uh, receptor. It's a basic slide. It's a transmembrane protein. has a, the extracellular domain, the transmembrane domain, and the intracellular domain. It needs to be activated, phosphorylated, to lead to a cellular response and why these genes are important. Just this slide is quite busy, but I like quite a lot. Just to give you an overview about uh, the several receptors in, uh, in cancer. And uh, if you see all this are drugs that being uh, studied uh, for cancer therapy, you see that each of these is not one or two, it's many. It means this molecule, these genes, are being targeted for cancer therapy for a long time, 
and uh, at a very important because they trigger different pathways and that it goes to another signal transduction cascades that end up with or cell survival or proliferation or resistance to therapy, angiogenesis, and metastasis. Uh, uh, the story about one particular uh, tyrosine kinase uh, that I'm going to show you started a long time ago, not even at, uh, when I was at ICGB. We were studying uh, renal cancer, <coughs> kidney cancer. Uh, and we were performing uh, microarray analysis in, in tumor versus uh, normal tissue up here to try to find a signature that uh, could indicate to us if one uh, particular sample was uh, was a tumor or a normal sample, and it, uh, in within the tumor uh, sample, we were trying to find if that signature could stratify in different types of cancer. That's what we did. Uh, we found like 30 unique gene signature that can uh, predict with accuracy uh, uh, if your sample is normal versus RCC. And we could also stratify this uh, uh, RCC because RCC has different types. I'm not gonna go through much into the RCC because they're gonna shift a little bit uh, soon. And But was not just uh, the goal was not just to find the signature, but also trying to find targets within this uh, cohort of patients that we could uh, identify and be uh, uh, explored later. And within the tumors, we found this uh, tyrosine kinase uh, receptor family. And in particular, we found this gene that is called AXL. I don't know if you heard about AXL, but AXL belongs to a family of genes, includes Chi and Mer. They are uh, activated by GAS6, which is the ligand, and leads to different cellular responses like anti-apoptosis, survival, ev even anti-apoptosis pathway. Right? It's, it's, it's been shown uh, to be overexpressed in different types of uh, cancer, like sarcoma, a gastric or breast cancer, and uh, enhanced uh, survivor cancer cell. Recently, there was a paper, but before talking to the paper, what I'm gonna tell you is recently also we show, Juliano here is the first uh, author of the paper, that AXL is really important for prostate cancer uh, uh, survival. And I'm not going to go to all the details here, but basically what we show in that paper, that's our last figure in the paper, which is AXL uh, triggers a cellular response via PI3K and AKT, leading to AKK alpha for, uh, phosphorylation and NF kappa B activation, which is going to then transcribe genes uh, such as IL6. And then we show that IL6 is secreted and comes back into the tumor cell, triggering STAT3 uh, activation. Okay? And uh, one month after we published this, a group in New York published a Nature Genetics paper, which is quite nice, um, showing that AXL is uh, responsible for resistance to EGF inhibitor therapy, basically. Uh, it was a quite nice, it means, if you have AXL, the chances that you have for getting resistant in the, in the after treatment is quite high. If you don't have AXL expression and activity, you're gonna, your prognosis is much better uh, than. It's a very elegant, it's very complex. I'm not gonna go through all the paper, though. But it's quite, it was quite nice because uh, we published this, and then, boom, um, like a month later comes a very nice paper showing that uh, that is really uh, important. And uh, more competitors in the market, anyway. <laughs> but it's fine. 
What we start them after publishing this paper, uh, uh, we try to follow two lines of uh, 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 research. First of all, okay, we found a target. It, then it comes from all this genomics and proteomics. We validate and so forth. What we can do for now is trying to find molecules that can hit this target, right? And the second one, as the, the Nature Genetics paper, and we're going to try to see if AXL in prostate cancer is also responsible for resistance. That's what we're going to show you now, OK? The first, we did the screening with different small molecule compounds. Uh, name it, it different libraries, uh, different compounds. I'm not going to all the details of this screening because it's a simple screening. You put, you try to find the molecule, high to, like 96 well plate, that you dump the compound and see if the AXL is affected or not, okay? And by, for our surprise, we were working with someone in the chemistry department at the University of Cape Town. They, they work with malaria. And uh, what I was getting everything that I could possibly get at that time uh, as a library of compound to see if I have something. And then comes uh, the only heat that we had, which was uh, artemisinin. Artemisinin is the drug that is used for malaria treatment, basically. It was quite surprised, though. Uh, uh, that uh, we had. In fact, what we got as a hit was DHA, which is a derivative of artemisinin, okay? And then, uh, uh, and was basically affecting AXL expression really hard. That's what I'm gonna show you. Was uh, basically, sorry for the names of the compounds that I changed a little bit for you to understand when is DHA or not, because when we got these libraries, they just come with codes, and I have no idea what they are. And basically, if you see here, DHA uh, inhibits, uh, 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 we have other compounds, but they were not specific for AXL, though, okay? Then uh, DHA inhibits AXL, inhibits proliferation. DHA is number 43. You're gonna see sometimes DHA, you're gonna see 43. It goes to the ice 504 uh, in one cell line, can be lower in the other cell lines. Uh, I'm just getting the slides for you. If you treat normal cell lines with DHA, you don't have effect. Uh, it means it's not affecting proliferation. It means it's, uh, and if you treat cells, there is no AXL, nothing happens here. It's just a simple, you have your control, you, 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 you treat with uh, silence RNA control, you go down in proliferation. If you treat the same cell line, there is no Excel, there is nothing happen. It means you need to have Excel expressed in vitro to get the effect. Uh, the same pathway that we describe in the paper, we, to be sure that uh, the drug is acting through Excel, if you see, is the same. Pathway it ends up not having SAT3, not having phosphorylation AKT, and uh, is also not affecting MER and tyro. If you remember the first time slide, is the other two members of the AXL family. Okay, please, if I go down in the voice because I cannot keep up, you just let me know. Okay, anyway, uh, DHA inhibits uh, induced sorry apoptosis. Uh, and also uh, inhibits the migration and in inhibits invasion of cancer cells. You guys know how to do this here. It's a simple trans well assay. I don't know if you, yeah, fine, okay. If you don't know any of the assay, it'd be pretty much basic assays. You should know how it works. Uh, how about in vivo? Uh, we got this uh, from literature, we treat mice with 40 milligrams is missing the G here, I'm sorry. Per kilo body weight, you reduce 50% the tumor size. And if you do the same thing with, when you implant cells without AXL, you don't see any reduction. It means, I showed you before that it's in vivo, in vitro, is specific for AXL. I'm showing you here that it's in vivo is specific for AXL as well. It means if you, if you implant the cells with AXL, you still have tumor formation. And, uh, but if you treat them with GHA, 40 milligrams per kilo body weight, nothing happens. 
this drug is uh, the citicel. What is the citicel? Do you guys know what is this drug or not? That's a current chemotherapeutic choice for patients with advanced prostate cancer. Uh, what happens, uh, it was approved by FDA in 2004 for the treatment of prostate cancer. Let me just give a brief overview about prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is usually two stages. The first one, the primary prostate cancer, responds to hormones. Okay, it depends on hormones to keep going. Usually the first line of therapy, you, you know, cut the hormones with analogs and then you shrink the tumor, and it can be done in combination of uh, radiotherapy or so forth. With time, the cell lines, they become resilient, and they become not responding to, to hormones anymore. That's what we call advanced prostate cancer. And then not just start growing faster, but also they spread out other uh, uh, organs. The main target usually is uh, bones, you can have um, in the bladder sometimes. They can be really nasty and go to the head. But most of the time, the main symptoms is to the bones, OK? And uh, at this stage, the, the analogs are not working anymore. It doesn't matter if you, they can help, but they don't work anymore. And uh, one of the choices is chemotherapy. Uh, and this was the, one of the drugs that people use in the clinic. The only problem with this, it doesn't last too much. I mean, enhances survival for three, four months. And this really, it's approved, but I tell you by own experience with my dad, I'm sorry, but uh, it doesn't help too much, I tell you the truth. It means expand the life for three, four months, but at this stage, the, the, the individual is not as good as they think they are to take a drug like that. Then there is a need today to develop new drugs to, to fight this disease anyway. Uh, basically, I'm just showing that we took this drug, which is available. We did the IC50 just to confirm that it was in literature. And what we did, we treat the uh, cell lines with uh, the citocell and the HA. And we perform an isobologram. Basically, you set up your drug in one concentration, and the other one you put in different concentration to see if they, uh, they don't like each other, or like if you get your uh, hit here, is the antagonist. Here, it doesn't happen anything. And if you get it within this, is the, they synergize to each other. And you can see that we did in different doses, and the docetacel and DHA, they synergize to each other. Then we thought, OK, let's test what happens if we put them together in another concept. Uh, if you pre-treat your uh, cells with DHA, and then you come with the citizen. If you realize you put it down 10 times, it means if you treat your cells with our drug, you're going to need 10 times less chemotherapeutic drug to treat your, uh, 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 to kill the cell, which is quite nice because the cell works in the mitosis. It means in a normal cell or in the tumor cell, it means the, 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 the side effects are quite high. Okay, and it doesn't matter which dose you do, you de decrease 10 times the, the concentration, which is quite nice. The other aspect is if you get your cell line and you get, you, 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 you remove AXL expression, that's a silenced RNA cell line you're going to need half of the dose. It means if your tumor doesn't have an AXL, you're going to, have half, you're going to need half of the dose to, to kill your cell, which is a quite nice stuff. If you look in mice, that's what happened. That's a normal tumor. You can imagine this in the mice, the poor mice. If you treat with DHA, you reduce by 50%. As I said, the set cell, if you put them is not much in size, but if you look the curve of the volume of this, it's quite drastic. The life is not expand too much in this for a mice. It goes up to seven, eight days. I don't remember more than than the the cita cell alone, but it increases the, uh, the the survival as well in vivo. Then comes the question: Is how this drug is affecting 
uh, AXL. That's nice. We see we got a, a target. Check. We got a drug. Check. Even still, we can uh, go for derivatives of DHA. DHA is not, there is no patent anymore. It means we, you, what we can do in these settings is trying to find a drug that is similar with better IC50 and so forth. Then uh, I still need to find someone to help us with this because I'm not chemistry anyway. But then comes the, the question for us, which did complicate our lives, in fact. With how DHA is affecting AXL, right? What we thought, and everybody was just telling us, uh, uh, it should affect other kinases for sure. Then what we did, we just bought the drug and sent to a company in San Diego. What's the name of the company? I forgot. What? Canon Skin or something. No, that's the name of the test. But the name of the it's inside of for you, I forgot the name of the company. You basically give to them the drug. They have 130 kinases. It's in vitro assay. They measure the phosphorylation activity in vitro. They are just checking this, the, 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 the activity. And then uh, it means it's going to tell you if your drug is affecting the kinase and how many drugs, uh, how many other kinases are affecting. That was the important question for us. And for our surprise, uh, as here, uh, hit below 35%. I'm not going to go how is this number was set by the company. means that that kinase is affected, right? And it's not affecting. <laughs> That's why I say complicate our lives, because it was not affecting any kinase at all. Which then, then again, it's not affecting the kinase. And basically, uh, but the, 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 our Western blood is clear, the phosphorylation is clear, everything is clear, but it's not affecting the kinase. I mean, it's not affecting the phosphorylation, the intracellular process that is necessary for activating, okay? And also, it's not affecting the other kinase. It means it's good, but it's bad at the same time. Then we thought that it's affecting two proteasome degradation. What we did, we put GMG132 and treat with the drug, but, AXL is still bye-bye, no expression. It means it's not through proteasome uh, degradation, right? What's the next step then? Someone? What? Transcription. Transcription, good. We follow the literature first. Uh, and we found in literature that the AP1 family uh, it's one of the major players in uh, AXL expression, and, uh, and basically it is. I mean, you treat with DHA, it goes down, uh, but not completely. Uh, if you put a time point, five hours, eight hours, 16 hours, it goes down, but it's not going more than this. It means you still have, even though it fits with the literature, is it still the expression is there. And if you look at, uh, 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 at the Western blot, you don't see Excel at all. The band is gone. And it's not just one. We've been doing this all the time. It seems should have something else other than just AP1 to, to tell me that's it. Then what we thought, uh, just to show you the AP1 story, just showing the, by gel shift, just show you luciferase assay. Now this is a gel shift here. Uh, that would basically the members that's involved in June D, FRA, FRA 2, and FRA 1, just to show you that we have all this data already. But then we thought, what can be also affecting transcription? Promoter methylation, for example, which means that that's a simple. If you have GPG island and it's methylated, you don't have the gene, but the AXL promoter is not methylated at all, and we did a methylation of the AXL promoter. That's an assay, and uh, uh, basically it's unmethylated. You're going to see this 5 hours assisted in, which is a, a demethylated agent. You're going to see quite a lot in the next slides. And uh, uh, just to show you, that's our control. Anyway, but the AXL is unmethylated. It means methylation is not affecting. That's what we thought about uh, uh, later is, microRNAs, right, transcription. 
and micro, uh, sorry for the methylation uh, word there, it's completely wrong, anyway. Then what we thought is maybe there is uh, something in the literature. Then what we found is not in prostate cancer, uh, uh, in other types of cancer, but in fact just in two, which we found uh, like uh, something that really did convince me, uh, uh, three microRNAs, the 34A, 1991, and 99B. What you're going to see in, in the next slides that I'm going to show you just this microRNA has something to do with AXL. But also, I was not happy with just uh, following the literature. We decided to see, because the question will come for us is, if you prove something before we start the whole stuff I told you, you know, if we come with this microRNA and say that the drug may affect this microRNA, someone is going to come to us and say, but is who tells me it's just the microRNA 34, okay? And we did, we pick up the drug and we uh, uh, did AFI, it's a Fimetric chip is available nowadays, which has 6,000 known coding RNAs, and we just treat the cells in different time points, whatever, different cell lines, and we run the chip. And basically, among the 6,000, that's what the short list that we got there deregulated in the, in the in a, by the drug. And they say, well, what are we gonna do now? Basically, we pick up all this, and we went to three prime UTR, that's usually where the microRNAs bind to the gene, and we start searching in the engine to see, and basically, the only a microRNA that, in this list, that fits in the, in the database of microRNA7. Then uh, we decide to investigate a little bit more about microRNA7 and the 34A regarding the DHL stuff, DHA stuff, uh, treatment. Basically, what I show you here, that's uh, this two cell lines, if you're familiar, fine. If it's not, I'm gonna tell you that uh, advanced prostate cancer, they do not respond to androgen. This is a, a primary prostate cancer. This is a normal cell line. Primary prostate cancer still responds to androgen, and we show in the, that oncogene paper that AXL is not expressed in this particular cell line. It means not expressed, I'm lying. It's, it's expressed, but in a very low level. And the same thing with PNT11, which is a, a normal cell line, okay? But it, AXL, it, it, it is expressed in the advanced prostate cancer. You can see by promoter methylation assays here, then uh, in cell lines, the AXL is not expressed. Uh, uh, the promoter is of both microRNAs are unmethylated, right? And in the cells that uh, 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 the AXL is uh, uh, expressed a lot, the promoter are methylated. If you treat with 5 ASA, as I said, that's our control, you revert methylation. But if you treat with DHA, you revert uh, methylation, okay? It means now we're showing you the DHA. In fact, it's methylating, uh, is a demethylated agent in, the, in these two promoters. And this is just an example. This is dose dependent uh, uh, assay. If you treat with different doses, you're demethylating the promoter. If you go and check the expression levels of each microRNA, and uh, as I mentioned before, cell lines, they express a lot AXL. Uh, uh, sorry, they do not express AXL. Both of them are upregulated. Cell lines that uh, are compared with the advanced one, the AXL is expressed the most. The same thing if you treat with our drug, the expression levels, they, in the, 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 the 34A goes to two and a half times more, and the, the same thing with MIR-7 here. Uh, what we did, as we have done a lot of experiments with mice, we pick up the tumor, and we did the same assays for methylation in the tumor in vivo to see mice treated with the drug and mice treated without the drug, and uh, as you can see, it fits uh, completely with the, the in vitro data, it means uh, the mice that were treated with DMSO basically, uh, the, 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 the microRNAs, the promoter is methylated, but the mice treated with DHA is unmethylated, okay? 
The same thing in vivo if you look at the expression levels of both microRNAs in the tumor versus uh, uh, the DHA-treated tumors versus DMSO-treated tumors. Uh, uh, 34 goes up to four times uh, higher and two and a half times for DHA. What we are doing now is a friend or colleague of mine at Brown University, she has access to tissue microarrays. She's also comparing tumor normal, the expression of these microarrays in, 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 in human tissue, just to complement that. Uh, here is you pick up uh, expression vector, just to show that's true. You transfect the microRNA, you, you know, uh, uh, decrease the Excel expression, and we're using both, and by the mRNA and the protein level as well. By consequence, you decrease a little bit proliferation, but uh, quite a lot of migration and invasion which has key characteristics of aggressive prostate cancer. Then we complicate more our lives. We were interested to know, OK, uh, we have a drug. We found the mechanism. But we need, we, I would like to know what is the key element in this demethylation process, OK? And then what we did, uh, basically, we in the past, we did the microarray uh, treated, not uh, non-treated cell lines. And uh, what did we decided to do, we went back to our list and our analysis and tried to see in that list if there is any gene there, they are deregulated and linked to methylation process. And the only one we found is this gene that I had no idea at that point what is this about. And uh, anybody is familiar with this gene? No, not me completely nowadays. I tell you the truth. I have no idea uh, in the past. But basically, that is the only one linked to methylation. And that's here in our list, previous list of uh, analysis. It's called Varid2. Moving to Varid2, I'm going to try to explain what at least I know a little bit, which is part of this polycom repressing complex 2, PCR2, which are involved in methylation of DNA. Basically, the key element in this complex is called EZH2, which is the responsible for methylating these uh, histones. And basically, JARE2 is here. It's a partner of uh, EZH2 and binds to DNA, mediating the process of methylation. Uh, I can go through all the exact ways that they're doing in complex, but uh, uh, we can discuss this uh, later if you want, not to extend too much the talk. Or you guys I can talk to Mike. He knows everything about complexes, proteins. Right, Mike? Nope. Yes. Basically, that's the structure of JARID2. And they have like uh, the, the domain that interacts with all these molecules. And there is the DNA binding domain, which is, it works like a chaperone. You know, if JARID2 is available, the complex comes, sits there, and then JARID sits in the, in the, in the DNA and allows easy to, to methylate the, in the histones. You understand, sort of? Right? And if they do this, uh, that's a more detailed picture of uh, the whole stuff. If they do that, you have different ways of interacting. They can, uh, 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 depending who is interacting in this big complex here, you have different response or even different targets. Anyway. Um, but that's what I want to end up usually is if this complexes link it to this GPD island, the DNA is not expressed at all uh, by methylation. If this PC, uh, PRC2 is present there, it's uh, 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 no, there is no way to, it means you need to remove this complex in order to have the activity of, of transcription factors binding to that particular region. Simple as that, basically. Uh, that's when we treat the drug that will happen, Jarid goes, disappears. 
the phosphorylation of EZ2, which is the responsible for the methylation, and the EZ2 needs to be phosphorylated, and most of the time, not all of them, it disappears as well, and is really the phosphorylation itself. If you knock down Jarid, you have, it was not as good as the DHA treatment, by the way, but you still decrease a little bit the, the, the phosphorylation. But what it was quite nice, if you knock down the GRDT, you see that is a big impact on the promoter methylation. It means we are linking the methylation of micro 7 and 34 to this particular molecule, right? It means in the cells that don't have GRDT, the promoter becomes unmethylated. And in cell lines that they have, the promoter is methylated. And basically, that's the same thing here. The expression in, uh, 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 of these two microRNAs in cell lines with, uh, without this is much higher than in cell lines with the, micro, uh, the, the gene. It here is just to show you the effect of DHA it depends on varied too. It means if you treat uh, 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 cells with DHA, microRNA 34 goes up. If you treat the uh, 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 cells uh, ready to you with DHA, nothing changes in these two settings. The same thing for microRNA7. You guys got the, Im the image, maybe. It's too complicated because it's a huge cascade. Nothing of this has been published yet, but it's totally new data for us. But uh, basically, what I just show you is we found the drug, we found the mechanism of action, and this through promoter methylation is inhibiting microRNAs, specifically 34, 8, and 7. And the gene that is responsible for this uh, methylation process is called Jarid2. Okay? What we are doing now is we are analyzing the second part is the AXL is involved in drug resistance in prostate cancer. Basically, we generate a cell line that is resistant to the, the CITA cell. It means it goes up to 85 to 100 nanomolar. That's what it fits with the liter literature. Uh, usually, they proliferate a little bit more, the, the resistant cell lines. Morphology, it fits what you found in the literature. It doesn't change too much. Uh, AXL levels in these resistant cell lines are uh, a little bit higher, two-fold to two-and-a-half-fold. The same thing in terms of protein is two-fold to two-and-a-half-fold uh, higher in the resistant cell line. And uh, in the resistant cell line, all the pathways regulated by AXL are upregulated as well. It means AXL is not just important for the development and progression, but maybe later it's going to have a, a critical role in the resistance to the current therapeutic drug. Uh, basically, we use here not our drug, but we in the, what we thought is if I use my drug, as not published, and then nobody's going to believe me, right? <laughs> then what we did, we, there is an a, a, a AXL inhibitor. It's called R428. It's been tested now, I think, in clinical trials. I'm not quite sure, but at least all the studies in vitro has been done. And it's a well-characterized stuff, but different from DHA, which is inhibiting via transcription, this compound inhibits via uh, uh, AXL activity by phosphorylation. Then what we did, we pick up this, you can buy this nowadays, and then we did the same experiments. It means if you pre-treat uh, your uh, cells with that component, you put 10 times lower. The same as DHA, it means our results with DHA are comparable with a drug that is being currently tested. Uh, if you remove uh, AXL, uh, also the, uh, 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 that's the data I already showed you anyways, but uh, if you get your resistant cell line and uh, you treat with the compound, you decrease nine times the amount of uh, the CETA cell needed. It means that's quite striking and tell us that also AXL has a role in resistant to therapy, basically. There is a long, uh, for the resistance, there is more studies that needs to be done. We need now to get this resistant cell line and knock down the AXL gene and see if it starts, uh, resumes responding to the CETA cell to prove that it's really important and find also the pathways that are regulated by AXL in the resistant cell line, basically. 
then basically what I show you up to now, AXL, appears to be crucial for prostate cancer development metastasis. There is also a vital role in drug resistance. Uh, I show you that uh, artemisinin and DHA, which is a derivative, are potent inhibitor of the AXL. And now what we want to pursue is find someone. In fact, we found the, someone in Finland that this, uh, was working with uh, Igbo Parker, which is the director of a Cape Town component. They were working a complete different direction than they, they were in Cape Town. I say he's a chemistry guy in Finland. In fact, he's a from Ukrainian. He, now we live in Finland. Nowadays, everybody lives in Anyway, and they are trying to produce the DHA derivatives for us in order to get a better compound with lower IC50s than we can test because we have all the tests already set up there. Okay, and then uh, in the, also an uh, interesting aspect of AXL that it's uh, being regulated by microRNA, specifically by microRNA uh, methylation. Uh, how long do I have? 10 minutes. Yeah, I'm gonna fly really fast on these slides just to show uh, a little bit of uh, uh, another uh, aspect of the research and not get you more confused because the first story is already a big story. <coughs> Everything started a long time ago when we published uh, papers showing that uh, NF kappa B regulates the family of genes called GAD45. It stands for Grover RS DNA Damage 45. Basically, NF kappa B regulates GAD45 alpha and gamma, which leads to. Uh, 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 survival. The, in fact, nf kappa b inhibits both gene expression. I also found that these genes, they can regulate gene activity and p53 phosphorylation, and they also uh, silenced by methylation process. That is the family of genes, alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, alpha and gamma, they, they work in one direction, which is apoptosis. Uh, the beta usually goes in the opposite direction, which is a more survival pathway. They have a common domain for MTK1 uh, binding, which leads to the release of the molecule, and the kinase domain here, which is, leads to activation of other kinases. What we did a long time ago is we did a mass pack for alpha, beta, and gamma. Is we overexpress this in the, in the cell line. We, we flag a tag. Uh, we just basically IP them, elute with flag peptide, run in a gel, cut the slice, put in a mass pack, and uh, we identify a couple of partners uh, other than the MTK1. I'm not going to go into details of all of them. If I have another time in interest, I will go. What I'm just going to uh, talk to you about is DCN1. I call DCN1 because the name is quite big for me to, to say. Uh, basically, what is DCN1? It's involved in a process that is called nedulation. Uh, just for you, everybody is familiar with nedulation other than Mike, Mauro, and the other group leaders. Nobody knows about that, no, okay. Uh, ubiquitination, everybody knows about that, right? <laughs> yes, uh, you, lead, you have a, a ubiquitin conjugated to your target, which leads to proteasome degradation by the, 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 the unit 26X. It's a very understood process, nedulation, leads to a conjugation, not a big chain, but a NAD8 molecule, involves E1, E2, E3, but E1, E2, E3 is a complete different uh, uh, a protein than E1, E2, E3 involving ubiquitination. In, in fact, nedulation enhances uh, ubiquitination in a un complete unexplored process. Basically, everybody is familiar with this, I hope so. The ubiquitin is, uh, uh, link it to the E1 uh, in a cascade, we go to E2, then it goes to a different complexes here for the E3, which is attached the ubiquitin to the substrate and leads to the proteasome degradation. In fact, in parallel, you have nedulation, okay, which the NAD8 is tagged to the E1, it passes to the E2, and the E2, through the help of the E3, 
put the nedulation here, enhancing the ubiquitination pathway. And where is our gene of interest? Is here, is the E3 ligase, okay? Now you know about nedulation, right? I hope so. No? One back slide? No, I have 10 minutes, sorry. Then uh, basically, uh, and at that time when we got this data, we went to the literature, and at that time there was a paper from the Millennium Pharmaceuticals that they were working nedulation in cancer, and they developed this molecule, it's called MLN4924. And basically this MLN4 inhibits this enzyme here, the E1, uh, uh, in the nedulation cascade. Okay, that's the molecule is available in at all. And then they claim this is uh, in, uh, helping the cancer treatment. And uh, I think they probably are through because I went to the uh, National Cancer Institute and that was uh, what I got as a clinical trials for this drug that's been in phase two and one for uh, uh, BCL lymphoma, AML, uh, and everything. It means that pass to the stuff, uh, the, the in vitro, and going to the uh, clinical data. What I think it's uh, my molecule is, if I, we find a drug that is better uh, uh, for this particular E3 ligase, it's going to be much more specific because if you block here, uh, it's more genetic than if you block something right here right? Then I think my gene is more interesting than their gene. But anyway, that's my name. Ah. And if I find the drug, that's the other story. They already found the drug. I'm not even close to that stuff. But that's what I think is uh, it's nice. Basically, what we did, is we did the same thing for AXL. We did for DCN1 as well. We test in the cell lines. You see the DCN1 is upregulated. Uh, it's also in uh, a preliminary data in uh, adenocarcinoma of the prostate. It's 42% uh, upregulated, which has been corroborated with immunostochemistry as well. Uh, we, uh, uh, that's just showing that it's a partner of GET45. I now even touched the GET45 story. We knock down DCN1, we inhibit proliferation, we inhibit migration, and 58% in mice models in vivo. It means it helps quite a lot. And we did initially, what we are doing now, we are trying to see uh, what happens with the activity of DCN1. But also, at that time, we were working with uh, something that called connectivity map. You may be familiar. I'm not, I'm gonna fly really fast. I have four minutes only. We did a microarray from cell lines, DCN1 negative, DCN1 positive, uh, D-chip whatever analysis, uh, engineering pathways to see which genes are deregulated, and we use this in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a in an approach they call connectivity map. Uh, uh, at that time, we were uh, working with connectivity map for other purposes. This paper has been submitted, but I'm not going to go to the paper. That's uh, a, a web uh, uh, resources made available for the Broad Institute. Broad is MIT, Harvard. Uh, um, which mainly, they, what they did, they treat four cell lines with tons of compounds, different time points, different uh, concentrations. They got all of them, they did microarrays, and they did an analysis. And they put this in a website. You can imagine. It means basically 1,309 small molecules, different concentration, different time points, four cell lines, you run the AFI, you need money, right? <laughs> and then you put in a website, and uh, basically uh, you have, for each drug concentration time point, you have your, your up and down list there. Basically, uh, I'm just gonna go far, it's a pattern matching algorithms that you can discover drugs that match uh, 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 with the drugs that are in the connectivity map database. Basically, what you do, you treat your cell line or your any particular cell line or you hit the particular gene, you run your UF metrics, you pick up your list of up and downs, and then you put in the website and ask them which drugs they match and which drugs are inverse. 
Okay, let me clarify this for you to have an idea. If you have normal to tumor, a signature that tells you that it goes to a normal to tumor, if you want to find a drug, you're going to try to find something that is inverse correlated. You're following me, right? Because if you find someone that matches, you're going to induce tumor. And if you knock down a gene, you're trying to find in the database something that fits with your, because the drug is going to have the same profile, sort of, OK? Uh, that's the, web, the website. If someone is interested, just go there and, and try. That's the way that you get your results. You, that's another way of getting your results. When we did this, uh, we test the 30 drugs that we got the top list, or let's say this, the 30 drugs that it could buy, basically, in South Africa, which is different than the 30 drugs they could buy in Trieste or in the US. That, that's the list of 30 drugs that I could find someone to deliver in my lab in South Africa, okay? And then five of them, they inhibit prostate cancer cell lines. There is no effect in the cell lines, the knockdown cell lines. So among these five, three decrease DCN1 expression and three induce apoptosis. We end up with these two drugs here, which is monazine, which is basically an a antiparasitic drug, and the podophilotoxin, I barely can say the name of the drug, which is inhibit uh, tubulin polymerization, which the stage that we are, basically, I'm just going to show you the data that I already told you, they induce apoptosis, they have no effect in knockdown cell lines, and basically that's the level DCN1, proliferation, and apoptosis. Now we're going to go to combine them to see if they have some effects, and then try to these drugs in mice, and DCN1 activity, basically. Uh, then I'm running towards the end of my talk. Basically, we have to see the DCN1 activity in prostate cancer. And these two tasks here, uh, it's for Mike, not for me. I'm trying to see with him what are the targets for DCN1, basically. And uh, the initial thought, we have two lines, right? One is to find the, a new, because nidulation is, is uh, what is described in the literature, you, it's been done for culins. The culins are nidulated, basically. Uh, we are interested to know if it's just culins that are nidulated in these settings or something else. And the last one, which is the pathways involved in nidulation culins in prostate cancer. Too much? Uh, thank you for the guys in uh, Cape Town. The Julian is here today. Uh, the Durai Hazia in a corner, and some other friends that have been helping me quite a lot in the in the recent years. And thank you. And sorry for the long. Time.